just got to say, I couldn't answer any of those questions. <laughs> Not any of them. But uh, what I want to do is, is feel free to ask questions at any point during this. Uh, I don't do this very often. I, don't, uh, I like to be in dark rooms watching film and uh, kind of behind the scenes. So uh, anytime during the course of this, just feel free to raise your hand and uh, I'll do the best I can. But we're, who out here is a, a Seahawk fan? <laughs> we're good, we're good. But can you just move right here to the middle? <laughs> I like to keep my enemies in the front yard. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's a, that's a great rivalry. I, I know we got a Giants fan in here as well, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer all the questions. But uh, what I wanted to talk to you about, you know, when I asked, what, what am I going to speak on? You know, Ann said, you know, I'd like to, you to speak on teamwork. And uh, the, the one thing, is this thing working? Okay, I always ask this question, you know, who's got the best job in the world? I would hope you all raise your hand, <laughs> right? Because, you know, a lot of times when people come up to me and they talk to me about the job and stuff, oh, you got the greatest job in the world. I do, but I've always believed that. You know, from the time I was little and I had my first job picking uh, detasseling the corn in the cornfields of Wisconsin. I, I've always believed that. And I've taken that approach with every job that I've ever had. I was going to do that job as well as I could, and uh, that would lead me to the next job, and the next job, and so on and so forth. And uh, I always tell this story when I was coming, when I, was, when I graduated college, I, left, I went down to the Twin Cities, and I was down there for a while, and I couldn't get a job. And I'm like, I had just got my college degree. I thought that promised you a job. And I couldn't find one. And uh, finally, there was a construction site that uh, was taking applicants. So I went to this construction site, and it was to work 110 feet below the city of Minneapolis, digging tunnels. And I thought, I can do that. You know, at the same time, I was a college football coach at a junior college. So I kept going, and the, the walking boss, big man, kept saying, so I think cut out for this. You can't do this job. And I said, why, why can't I? You know? And uh, make a long story short, I get the job after a week of pestering the guy. And every day, down I'd go into the hole. Come out every day after. So you go down when it's dark, you come out when it's dark. Spent about 450 days under the city of Minneapolis building this tunnel. And one day I came out of this tunnel, this is an honest to God true story, came out of this tunnel and, and every day, every, every month or so you would move from hole to hole to hole. So you'd come out a different, a different hole every now and then. They raised me out of this hole and, and there's a sign right in front of me, athletic director, basketball coach needed. I said, that's my job. <laughs> I was tired of going in the hole. So I literally got out of the cage, filthy, muddy, dirty, and I walked into this school. It was called Heart of the Earth. And uh, anyone here from Minneapolis area? You know where Dinky Town is? Do you remember Heart of the Earth? It was an alternative school for Native Americans. And I walked into the school, and uh, the, the lady sitting there looks at me, and I looked at her, and she goes, Trent Balky. I said, yes, how do you know me? You went to, you, you lived with my son in college. This is a true story. So, make a long, she ushers me back, she goes, you want this job? I said, I'd love this job. She goes, it's yours. But you gotta meet with Bill Means and Clyde Belcourt. And if anyone knows anything about the American Indian Movement, they were the two big, big uh, leaders back then. And I believe Clyde's still involved. But anyway, I got the job. And I thought that was the best job I ever had. You know, and then I went from there, got into coaching, followed my dream to be a professional football coach. That's what I wanted to be. And along the way, I got tired of making basically minimum wage to coach. I got tired of uh, every interview I went on. I interviewed for three Division I coaching jobs. 
and uh, got turned down at every one. And the final one I got turned down on was at the University of Minnesota. And the reason I got turned down, Jim Wacker was the head football coach at the time, who had taken the exact same path I had taken. He had coached junior college, he had coached in the Dakotas at North Dakota States and uh, moved on to TCU, had worked his way up the chain. And he looks at me and goes, you're by far the best candidate for the job, but I can't hire you. And I said, well, why can't you hire me, Jim? And at that, I said, Coach Wacker. But, and his response was, I can't hire you because you don't have any experience in Division I football. And I looked at him and I said, you know, respectfully, where did you get your start? And his response was, well, you know, I coached at such and such in North Dakota State. And I said, exactly. And now you're the head coach at the University of Minnesota. I said, but you're not going to offer me that same ability to get to improve myself. And he said, I just can't. You don't have enough experience. I left there. I quit coaching. I got out of coaching completely, got out of football. And uh, I walked into the, the uh, head coach's office, uh, who's now a real good friend of mine, uh, Mike Daly at the time, and I said, Coach, I'm done. I quit. And uh, he said, you're just going to walk away. And I told him the story, and I said, I'm done. So I packed up, my, I told my wife, I'm done, we're quitting, we're out of football. So I left, I drove up to North Dakota, and I got a job uh, training athletes. And after a year of doing that, I said, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go into the business world. <laughs> so I was interviewing for a job with the principal financial group, had taken my Series 5, was going to get ready to take my Series 7. And I was interviewing with this company, and uh, the guy was set to hire me. And I just said, you know what, I need a weekend to think about it. So I took the weekend to think about it, and lo and behold, on Sunday, I left. I went fishing. And my wife calls me on Sunday and she said, I just got a call from Bill Parcells and Dick Haley from the New York Jets. And I said, come on, and I'm up here fishing, you know, leave me alone. She goes, no, I think it's serious. So I said, okay, give me the number. And I called her. And it was. It was Dick Haley and Bill Parcells and they wanted me to fly to New York in my fishing clothes. Every interview I've had seems to be in dark, you know, dirty clothes, position. And uh, so I flew out to New York, got the job, and now I'm here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just the, the path that you take in life, you know, I've always, I've always tried to, to, to do things and make decisions not based on money. I've never been afraid to walk away from anything. I've never been afraid to bet on myself. Because I believe what I just said, what, no, no matter what you're doing, if you believe it's the best job in the world, and that doesn't mean you can't have aspirations to be something different. If you're a salesman and you want to be a, a manager, whatever, if you're a technician and you want to own the company, doesn't mean you can't have aspirations, but you must take care of the job that you have in front of you. And as we go through this, I think you'll see a lot of how it relates. I think the hardest thing in the world, the hardest thing in the world for a manager to do is take a team, take a group of individuals, as you see there, a group of players in this case, and make a team out of it. I think that's extremely difficult to do. Because you've got to get every one of those players to believe that they've got the best job in the world. You've got to get every one of those coaches to believe they got the best job in the world. You got to get every one of your front office staff, your training staff, your logistics staff to believe that same principle. And if you can do that, you're truly a good manager. Let me go one step further. You're a great manager if you can do that, if you can accomplish that goal. Because taking, especially when you're in the business that we're in with so many type A personalities. Probably no different than the world you live in. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to retirement because I'm going to move to somewhere where there's no type A personalities except me. 
I'm moving to Take B Island. Because <clears throat> when you take those individuals and you get them to believe in what we just talked about, okay, individuals win games. Individuals can make some sales, okay, but teams win championships. So if you've got a team of good salespeople, that you, or a group of good salespeople that you can build into a team, chances are you're going to build your company bigger, better, faster than anybody else because they've all bought in. They're worried about their job. They're not worried about the person sitting next to them. Okay? One thing when I took over the 49ers, we had a lot of good people. And I, and I, had the, I was fortunate because I, I was able to, to sit there for five years and really evaluate everybody in the organization because that's how my mind was working. You know, Are these people, if I were to get a job as a general manager, never thinking I was going to end up with the 49ers, but if I were to get a job as a general manager, would I want that individual with me? And that's something that I think you can still do your job extremely well and have aspirations, but still stay focused on the job that you have. But if you want to win championships, and the 49ers have been very successful in doing so, uh, not as of late, we're getting there. We're getting there, it's a process. Uh, see, I go to bed at night and I think, Third down, or I, I go to bed at night, I, this, I wake up, and, and a friend of mine, Ted Thompson, who was with the Green Bay Packers, said after I lost, after we lost the Super Bowl, he said, you know what, that'll never go away. And you know, I wish he was wrong, but he's right. It never goes away. You wake up thinking about it, you go to bed thinking about it. I honestly don't believe there's a day that goes by that I don't think about it. Uh, but we're going to get there. So when you, when you look at the essentials to building a winning culture, and this is nothing new to anybody in this room. You know, the old cliches, I'm not a big cliche guy, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in canned speeches or anything like that. I believe in speaking from the heart. But when you look at uh, the essentials to having it, respect is number one. You know, and I think through it all the time, respect, you know, so many people in this world want to be liked. I could care less if I'm liked. I care a whole hell of a lot more if I'm respected for the job that I do, uh, for the type of man that I am, for the type of father that I think I've become. I would much rather be respected in life than liked. I don't need to drink beer with people. You know, and tell you know, all the old stories, because that doesn't matter. What matters to me is that people respect how you come to work every day, how you treat others. And you've got to have a culture of that. If, you're only, if, if everyone in your organization only believes in themselves and only really cares about themselves, it, you, you may have some victories, but you're not going to build championships. You just can't. Trust, loyalty, you know, when you're, especially when you're dealing with type A personalities, you have to be able to develop that. Whether it's for me with a player, with a coach, with the owner, you gotta be able to speak freely. You gotta trust one another. You know, accountability. Do you trust the guy next to you that, to do his or her job and do it well? You know, and then energy. Come to work every day with a positive energy. You know, our coach talks about an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Well, I don't know about that, okay? But I know when I come to work, I mean, I get in that car in the morning and my mind's already going. Okay, what do we got to get done today? You know, and if you come into the building and your, per and your energy isn't there, you can't expect everybody else's to be there. It just doesn't happen that way. They feed off of you. What's the worst thing that I can do when we lose a football game? Come into my office and close the door behind me and not come out of it until the end of the day. I'd love to do it, 
I'd love to bury my head in the sand and not come out for a week till the next game. But you can't do that because everybody's looking to you for leadership. So how do you go about building a successful team? You know, you have to have a clear vision. And this is, this isn't a, you know, and anyone who wants this information, I can send it. You don't have to take notes, but, because I don't think I'm telling you anything that's special, to be honest with you. But you have to sell your culture. Internally, every day, you have to sell that culture. What do you believe in? What are your standards? What do you want to accomplish? And you have to continually sell it. You got to eliminate the personal agenda. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to get rid of the personal agendas in buildings. Yeah. Once again, who's got the best job in the world? You know, I do. And you got to believe that. And you can't, you can't, if you get in an argument with someone, uh, Jeff Ferguson, who's our Vice President of Football Operations, says, how do you do this? How do you just vent and then turn around and a minute later not even worry about it anymore? I think that's the sign of, you have to get over it. And you have to let the people underneath you know that if, if, if you and I don't disagree and I want it done a certain way, that's okay. It's going to get done that way. And if you do something wrong, if you screw up, you know, you vent, you get it over with, you let them know, him or her know it's not going to happen again, and, and, and you set the record straight, but then you move on. Some people can't get over it. They get mad at somebody, and then they just stay mad. And it, it doesn't do anything for the culture of the building. I think this is a big one that people in leadership positions really have a hard time getting established in their, in their business. Defined roles. Everybody in your organization must know what their role is. They must know what their responsibility is and they must be held accountable for it. If they're not, it's what I get, just went back from, it's you're worried more about her job than, and she's more worried about your job and so on and so forth. You have to define the roles and hold them accountable. And, and when they step out of that role and they start worrying about somebody else's job, and this is one thing that was, was prevalent with the 49ers four years ago. If you went to somebody and you said, why did we do this? Their answer, what, they didn't answer the why to the question. They said, well, so-and-so is doing this. I didn't ask him about so-and-so. Could care less about so-and-so. Wanted to know why you aren't doing it the way you're supposed to be doing it. You want to go into a, a, a building of failure? I can walk into a building, and I, and I know many of you can as well, and you can tell when you're in a successful building and when you're not by just how many doors are open. You go into a building, uh, and I've been on a lot of bad teams, trust me. A lot of bad teams, too many, okay? But you go into those buildings, coaches' doors are shut, scouts' doors are shut, you know, and they're all on the phone. They're all looking for their next job. And guess what? You're gonna, be, you're gonna have to be looking if that's the mentality you come to work with. So the next part of it is focus on people. Bill Parcells is a mentor of mine, someone I couldn't stand up here and say enough about, but it, uh, one of the greatest coaches, one of the greatest leaders, one of the greatest human beings I've ever been around. And when I got the job, he called up that day, and he says, let me tell you something. You know, you're gonna start running in the big circles, you're gonna start drinking wine and eating cheese and all this other stuff. He said, uh, let me tell you what your real job is. It's find the right people. He goes, you built a career on finding the right people. Now your job just became magnified because you still have to find the right players, but now you have to find the right coach, the right coaching staff, 
the right front office people, the right scouts. Talent acquisition as a manager, as a leader, is your number one job. If you fail at that, you will ultimately fail in what you're doing. So your focus, your energy has to be on acquiring talent. Okay, you attract it, you select it, and then you have to develop it. The New England Patriots are a model program. And they're a model because it doesn't matter every year three or four or five or six of their people get plucked, right? And they just keep on going. The machine just keeps on churning. Why is that? Because they've got people underneath ready to step up. Very seldom do you see them, when they lose somebody at a higher position, go hire someone from outside to fill that role. They fill it from within. And that, to me, is, is something that is critical of having a developmental program within your organization so that your leaders, your managers, are already in the building, the next wave of them. And when, the, when somebody moves on, or for whatever reason, retirement, not getting the job done, accepts another job somewhere else, you're ready. You just hire, you just promote, and then you go hire another person underneath, and you start getting them ready. And those, to me, are the programs that are consistently successful. Five years with, the, with Alex Smith, who I love dearly. Five years. Could you imagine if you were Alex Smith, and for five straight years you had a different coordinator, and you were asked to run a different offense? And I know there's a lot of 49er fans in here, and I'm sure everyone has an opinion. I don't care about that opinion, right? <laughs> Great man, good football player, uh, extremely intelligent, can pick up systems like this, but I don't care who you are. And going back to that, that, those questions that were being asked, I couldn't answer any of those questions. Alex Smith could. He could answer them. 41 on the Wonderlick score. But Every year you come to work and you got a new plan. I don't know how that works. I don't know how you get better. And we didn't. We never had a winning season, uh, you know, during that tenure. And then, and then, uh, in 2011, I guess we we got things turned around a little bit. But it all comes down to developing them, getting them ready to go. You know, and then assessing them on a daily basis, a weekly basis, an annual basis, quarterly, however you do it. And when somebody isn't doing their job, you put them on notice. Do it all the time. There's no lifetime guaranteed contracts if you're the video director or you do the laundry. But yet, one thing you'll see when you go to the 49ers organization I don't care if you're sweeping the floors, or playing, or coaching, or general manager, okay? Everyone gets treated the same, with respect. And when we see that somebody isn't doing that, they're not treating someone with respect, we handle it and we handle it quickly. One, one analogy I always use, when you go to a good restaurant, or any restaurant, um, how do you know, let me, let me phrase it like this, who's the most important person in a restaurant? The customer, the good, some people would say that, I, I don't disagree. Who else, outside of the customer? If you're going to a good restaurant, what do you want? The chef. Service. The chef, right, good food. Okay? I am hope I'm getting there with you. Okay? I think the most important person could be the person that cleans those bathrooms. Because I've gone to restaurants, and some of you will think about this, I've gone to restaurants, I've had great steak, I've had great wine. You know, like Coach said, wine and cheese, yeah, I, I partake in it. I've had, I've had great food, and I've gone into the bathroom at some point, 
and it's filthy, it, 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 it smells bad, and I've never gone back to that restaurant, and I think some of you are the same way. So who's the most important person in that restaurant? The guy cleaning the toilet. You know, and we laugh, but there's some truth to that. So never underestimate your role. Never underestimate the people in your organization, the roles that they have. And never settle for expectations lower for anybody. If they're the janitor, do their job. Right? If you're the top salesperson, do your job. That's what you're paid to do. So my eyes are so bad I can't even read this thing. <laughs> That's how long I've spent in the dark room. Uh, in your hiring process, okay, if you're going to make exceptions, and this is a Bill Parcells thing here, okay, build in like exceptions. If you were a 5'9 linebacker, good luck. Off the board. We're not talking about it. Okay? If you were if you ran 4'8 and you were a safety, off the board. Because if you start making exceptions, his belief is by the end of the day, by the end of the year, by the end of the, the, your tenure, you're going to have a team full of exceptions. And you can't win with a team full of exceptions. So when he got off the bus with his team, he wanted them to look a certain way. Same in business. Okay? You want things done a certain way. That's what Bill wanted. If you're going to make a, an exception, his belief was it's got to be calculated. You got to know why you're doing it. And the thing in football we use for exceptions is production. Okay, Borland this year, Chris Borland, we drafted him in the third round out of the University of Wisconsin. Bill called him up. What are you doing? He's four. He runs four eight. I know, I know. He's got 29 inch arms. I know, I know. He's five foot eleven. I know, I know. He doesn't meet any of the standards. I know, Bill. Why'd you draft him? Because he's productive. He goes, okay, you got me there. Okay? And, and you, so if you are going to make those decisions, make them calculated. Know why you're making that decision and then make it work. Okay? And the last part about empower others. Micromanagement does not work in my mind. You can disagree with me. Some people like the power. Give you another Bill Parcells. How many people remember a linebacker uh, by the name of Brian Cox? Okay, we got some people. Brian had just got kicked out of Miami, basically. You know, in a, you know, he, he, he went off the reservation, so to speak. Uh, couldn't control, uncoachable. Nobody wanted him. Bill Parcells wanted him. And I'm just sitting back, and at that time, young in the business, scouting, I'm like, why is he doing this? Why would he want this guy? We don't need this guy. But Bill thought, and he had a plan. So he brings Brian Cox in, and Brian Cox is a model citizen for the New York Jets. We go 13-3, and three, go to the AFC Championship game, lose to Denver. But the whole year, Brian Cox was a leader, never had one problem with him, couldn't, couldn't have been better. So after that, the next year, I said to Bill, I said, Bill, what? What did you say to him? He said, Trent, he said, you have got to figure out what makes these guys tick. You've got to figure out where your connection with them is. He said, with Brian, I knew two things about Brian. Brian loves football. I love football. Brian loves horses. I love horses. He said, so I knew I had a connection with him. I knew I could get to him. I said, okay, that's, where is this going? <laughs> he goes, so I brought him into my office and I said, Brian, we both love football. Yeah, coach, we both love football. He goes, yeah, we both love horses. He says, yeah, I love horses, coach. I love to go to the track. He goes, well, so do I. And he goes, in all your times at the track, how many, ti how many times have you seen more than one jockey on a horse? Brian goes, never. Okay? He says, how many times have you seen a jockey with more than one whip in his hand? He says, never. He says, we're getting somewhere with you, Brian. <laughs> he says, I am the jockey, 
and I have the whip. Okay? Now here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you this whip every now and then. And I'm going to let you know when you got it. And you can keep it until I tell you it's back in my hand. So that's how he went through practice. He'd go up to Brian and say, Brian, you got the whip today. Brian would take it and run with it because he knew what that meant. Go lead. Go lead the way you lead. Go push. You know, because Brian was a pusher. Brian was intense. He practiced how he played the game. And then when, when Bill saw him going over the edge, he'd go up and say, give me the whip back. Give me the whip back. And that's how he managed Brian Cox. And if you think about it, I think as a manager, as a leader, you got that same scenario taking place in your own organization, and at times, you got to let them have the whip. And then you have to also know when to pull it back. But, uh, and this goes along with micromanagement. You know, visionaries, specialization, we always talk about that as a manager. If you look at all the things, and I don't know if you can see, because I can't see it, but all, but all of those categories underneath that first line, those are all departments that I'm responsible for. The PR department, the logistics department, the coaching staffs, the player personnel evaluation, all of that falls under my umbrella. I am not an expert in hardly any of it. If I had to say where I do have the most background, it would be on the personnel side. Logistics, I just want the bus to show up on time. Okay, I don't know how to get it there, but I know I want it there. Okay? But as a manager, sometimes we think we have all the answers regardless of whatever we're talking about, whatever division we're talking with. So I look at it like this. My job is to have a breadth of knowledge. Know a little bit about everything. But more importantly, know what we want from every department. And then it's up to me to hire, go back to acquisition of talent, the people that can get the bus there on time. The people that can make me look halfway intelligent in the media, which is awfully hard to do. Okay? Because I really... Are there any media members in here? <laughs> you with the camera, are you? <laughs> but then the depth of experience, the, the depth of not comes from experience. I can't possibly know everything there is to know, but the longer I'm doing this, the more I learn about logistics, the more I learn about the other areas, the more I listen. Because in most of those meetings, I just listen. Because I couldn't honestly answer a lot of the questions, just like I couldn't earlier. So you got to listen, you empower your people, you hire the right people, and you let them do their job. I strongly believe in that. Have the vision of what you want, and let them specialize in the areas that they specialize in. And the last part of it is, the last question that Angie posted uh, you know, for me to answer is, you know, dealing with diverse personalities in a type A, highly competitive environment. How do you do that? Two words, not easy, right? It's not. There's nothing I can tell you that's magical in dealing with, with, with uh, a coach like Coach Harbaugh or, or, or certain players. But there are some things you can do, okay, that will allow you to have a much better chance for success. Number one, check your ego at the door. You have to check your ego at the door. Because the worst thing you can do is for two type A personalities to bring their ego into the room and then all you get is a back and forth. That's rarely productive. So somebody has to check their ego at the door. And if you're the leader, oftentimes it has to be you. Because if you don't, it's going to be counterproductive. That, that autocratic mentality doesn't always work. In fact, rarely works with a type A personality. If you back a type A into the corner, 
they're going to come out fighting. Right? That's that's how they're wired. So you gotta you gotta outsmart them. Okay, you gotta outmaneuver them. Deflect credit. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're successful, if your team is winning, if you're successful, who cares? Who's the reason for it? Why is it so hard to take a successful team and go back and do it again? Because everybody, when you win, wants to be the reason why you win. And when you lose, nobody wants to be the reason. So when you're winning, everybody wants more money. They want more attention. <coughs> and when you lose, the bunkers, they close the doors, they hide. All right? A good leader in tough times is the one that doesn't close the door. They gets out front and says, this is what we need to do. This is how we're going to get it corrected. So deflect blame, all right? Deflect it. I should say deflect credit and assume blame, OK? Confront conflict. Can't hide from it. It's not going to go away. If the head coach is mad at me and I close my door, I can only keep it closed so long. i got to come out for food. And then he's going to catch me, right? So you might, as well just, you might as well just get to it. You know, and there's going to be back and forth. And there's going to be some tough talks. But at the end of the day, if you go back to what I said earlier about respect, if there's genuine respect between individuals, they'll, they'll come around. They might not agree with you right then. But once again, if you're one of those people, you're more worried about being liked than you are respected. Let them leave mad. He'll come around, or she'll come around, but if you always chase after him and try to give him rationale or give her rationale for why you made the decision, that's just going to complicate the relationship moving forward. Don't worry about being liked at that moment. Care more about being respected. And then I, I just said that, get to the point. You know, with the, don't bring someone into the office and start schmoozing them and then, then hit them between the eyes or her between the eyes with the, with the knockout punch, right? Just get to the point. This is why you're here. This is what I want to talk about. This is what I think. This is what needs to be corrected. You know, share me your thoughts on it. If they have something to say, great. You work through it. If they don't, move on. Next, next, next problem, next, next task at hand. Okay? Be consistent. Treat everybody the same. I really believe in that. I don't care if you're the head coach or the janitor. If you make a mistake, fess up to it. All right? Be consistent with how you handle them. Can't fire somebody for doing something and somebody else does the exact same thing and give them a slap on the wrist. Follow up. Okay, if you say it, do it. I've been around too many people that they say stuff, they never do it. Okay, they, they want you to leave happy, but then they never get down to doing it, and vice versa. And then the last thing is understand precedent. Every decision that we make as a leader sets precedent. If you're a 49er fan right now, you, you know that Alex Boone is in a holdout, okay? When you're dealing with contracts, everything you do sets a precedent. And when you're talking about type A personalities, what do type A personalities want? More, whatever everybody else has, they want it, okay? So if you break a precedent in your belief, and you negotiate with Alex Boone differently than you negotiated with Navarro Bowman, Pat Willis, or any of these other people that you've done contracts with, guess who's knocking on your door? Navarro, Pat, and all of them. Why did you do that? Why did you do that for him when you wouldn't do it for us? So there's some principles at stake every time you make a decision. And don't, don't be blinded when you make decisions and think, well, nobody will catch that. Nobody will catch that I did that for this. Because they do. It eventually comes out. might not come out today, but it could come out tomorrow. 
the next day. And at some point, you're going to be dealing with the problems, and you have no one to blame but yourself. You've created them. So with that, I, what I'd like to do, since nobody asked one question while I was talking, <laughs> I'd like to open it up for questions. And it can be football-related or stuff off of what we just discussed. Uh, but feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, you said you're always looking for your next job. What do you see your next job as? <laughs> I don't believe I said it like that. <laughs> I said there's no, let me let me go back because I got a great memory. It's like an elephant. I believe I said there's nothing wrong with doing your job and doing it very well, but at the same time looking ahead to what you might want to do. Okay? I've got the best job in the world. I honestly believe it. But I, like I said, I always do, but now I really believe it. You know, I'm like a, I'm gonna retire, God willing, on my own on my own. I'm not going to be forced into retirement. And uh, then I'm going to go find that island with type B personalities. And hopefully we'll have enough money to buy that island along the way. That's it. That's an easy crowd. Sports in general has, I um, mean, you get a lot of, like you said, type A personalities and there's, there's, the image has gotten worse over the years with domestic violence, the all the, you know, I guess the, the criminal activities and such. Do you see a way for the, the leaders of that, you know, the different sports to clean that up and to drive that home, or is it just we're going to continue on this trend? Well, it's tolerated, I guess I would say. Well, it's not tolerated. I, I, I want to make that very clear. It's not tolerated. It's uh, This isn't a sports issue, this is a societal issue. Uh, it's, it's a sport issue because they're. The, the notoriety that these players have, they're in the public eye. Uh, but I've always said, you take a hundred type A personalities, you put them in a room. If it's in your line of work, our line of work, anybody else's line of work, if they're type A personalities, they're risk takers, right? That's what type A person, you, and, you, and you make them write down all the things that they've done over the last year, DUIs, you know, all the other stuff, you're going to find a lot of similarities. It's not just athletes. It's what society is becoming. And, and it's, a, it's so, I don't look at it as a football or a sport issue. I look at it as a societal issue. And when you look at our football team, I, I tell our guys all the time, I will, su I will support you. I will go to the wall for you but I will not defend you. I will not defend your actions. You have to be responsible for your actions. And there's different ways that we can certainly hold them accountable for their actions, but it's not always as easy as the media, mainstream media, would like us to believe or would like you to believe. Because there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of regulations, uh, there's a lot of policies that we gotta fight through and deal with. And sometimes we make the wrong decision. I've done it. And you learn from it, and you hope not, you're not going to make that wrong decision the next time. I usually don't tell this story, but I will. I got my first job in coaching. I got in uh, 1990, my first legitimate full coaching job at South Dakota State University. One month later, I got a DUI. So I'm sitting in there, my wife's, you know, uh, pregnant with our first child, and uh, I'm in, I'm in the, 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 the cell, and you get one call, right? Who do you call? Call my, call my wife? No, no way. <laughs> Not doing that. <laughs> so I called my coach, the head coach, Mike Daly, and I said, Coach, got a problem here. He said, what's the problem? I said, well, I just did something I shouldn't have done. Craig got a DUI. Ha, huh, DUI? He says, let me tell you about the time I got mine. <laughs> True story. And right away, there was relief. Because I knew I wasn't going to get fired. Right? 
So I learned a lot from that experience. A, don't drink and drive, okay? But B, have compassion. So it's easy to say what people should do, but if he would have fired me right then, I may never have gotten a job again in the coaching world, right? And I certainly wouldn't be standing here. And the exact same reason I flew him to Baltimore or to New Orleans for the Super Bowl, him and his family. So when you're dealing with these guys, and this is a long-winded answer to your question, but I really believe, you know, and I, I want to get this message out there, these are not bad guys. If they were bad guys, they wouldn't be a part of the San Francisco 49er organization. But when I look across from Alden Smith or, or any of these other guys that have gotten themselves in a little bit of trouble, I see good men. But they're only going to become great men if somebody help them. Somebody helps them along the way. You know, but if every time somebody screws up in your organization, you open the door and throw them out, okay, people aren't going to look at you as a leader. They're not going to look at you as a leader. Trust me. But if you stand up for them, not defend them, you stand up for them and try to teach them the right way to do it, they'll get it eventually. And if they don't, and they just continue to make those mistakes, then you've got to do what you have to do. So you mentioned calculated exceptions, and you mentioned you all the set. If uh, instead of all the set, you know, there's somebody on the practice squad or, or you know, the, the, the third or fourth death safety, and some of the things that happen, is, it, is there a copy, I'm not looking for you to go in free detail, but yeah. is there a copy exception when somebody has incredible talent where you can they go farther? Because that's something that happens in the day-to-day business as well. Somebody late, for example, is not a record, or they're most talented, whatever. And so is that a common exception, or is that uh, setting precedent? How do you deal with that? How do you see that? It's a very fair question. And it's, I like to believe my job is to help young men, right, reach, reach their, 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 their level of success, whatever that is. Uh, does getting drafted in the seventh round, or does, I should say, does getting drafted in the first round afford you the opportunity to make a few more mistakes? I'd be lying to say that it doesn't. And the reason it does is because of the financial ramifications of a decision to move a player on versus someone that you've got a lot less invested in. But I think when you're dealing with the, the human part of it, your job is to help Alden Smith no different than it is to, to help that college free agent that's making you know, the minimum wage for you. That's your job as a human. That's the human part of it. And if you're not willing to go there, you'll, the, the room, the locker room will, will identify you as a person they cannot trust. Okay? Because a locker room is a very delicate place. And when you, get it, when you start talking about a locker room, there's locker rooms within a locker room, right? You've got the defense, you got the offense, you got the D-line, you got the running backs. So there's locker rooms within the locker room that you really have to understand in order to put a team together. It's not about acquiring all A talent. We've seen that, right? You can have a room full of A players, but they don't, they, they, they don't learn to play together. They never become a team, like we talked about at the beginning, right? It's a group of individuals. So I think, hopefully answering your question, they got to believe in you. And they got to believe you're going to do for that person what you're going to do for this person. And if they do, then you got something special. That's not right, or I don't believe in technology. Why am I even speaking here? No. no, honestly, I mean, we do a lot. I think the people that uh, uh, follow the 49ers realize the partnership we just made with SAP, and uh, they are in the process, we are in the process of working with them to develop uh, a 
application, a program for our personnel department that is far reaching, that goes back and can, can uh, quantify a lot of information in a short period of time and really give us a look at the historic value of players on, uh, on height, weight, speeds, uh, you know, different, different, different entities that we're trying to, trying to look at. You know, the HRT scores, the psychological. How do, we, how do we take all this vast amount of information and make it so a guy that graduated from Bemidji State with a football, with a football degree, physical education, understand it, right? Uh, so we've got a whole analytics staff that does a lot of work uh, with them. I have a, a programmer that deals specifically with SAP so that they can hopefully put this together because the problem we've had in the National Football League, nobody stays around. IT companies come and go because there's no money to be made. There's only 32 of us, right? So they build the program, they sell you the program, and then they find out there's no more money to be made, and the only thing to be made is the maintenance of it, the service of it. So two, three years, they're out of business, and now you have a program that nobody can manage or, or uh, fix, right? So that's the problem we've had in the National Football League. This is my 20th year, and I think no less than seven programs in those 20 years that have gone out of business. So we got, we're, we're hopefully gaining ground in that area. But once again, we said this earlier, that baseball and football are two different sports. You can't quantify things in football the same as you can in baseball. So it's a, it's a little bit different. I have just a quick question. As a leader, assessing strengths and weaknesses of this part of the force, you look at your leader every day. Looking at yourself as a leader, what do you what do you see as your greatest weakness? How do you how do you mitigate your conflict with your mindset? Intelligence. You know, I mean. I, you know, that's a good question. I get, you stump me. I'm usually not stump, but you know, there's so many things that I want to get better at. You know, de just dealing with the day-to-day -day, uh, ups and downs of the profession. I'm a sore loser. You know, just ask my, my, my daughters and ask my wife. I'm a sore loser. I hate losing with a passion, and I don't care what it's at. And to me, that's not a good thing. You know, that's a bad thing. So I think if you had, if, if, to answer that question, it would be getting better in that area and being able to leave a game and not take it out on everybody around me. And because I can in the position I am, I generally take it out on myself. You know, so by the time the next morning rolls around, in which case I probably haven't slept, and I'm on the way to the office with two cups of you know, Starbucks trying to figure out why we got beat, you know, that's what you got to get, but you got to be able to get rid of it. Here's a softball question for you. She's had a hard one. <laughs> First of all, congratulations on the new stadium. Um, besides the new stadium, what are you most excited about for this coming year for the 49ers? What are some of the things that as fans we should be looking for and things that you're excited about seeing? Well, I mean, the stadium's unbelievable. If anyone's had, a, how many have had a chance to go into the stadium? Uh, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I've got, uh, you know, in the last 20 years, I've been in every major college stadium in the country. I've been at every NFL venue. I've been at most of the the uh, major league baseball venues in this in this country. It's it's off the charts. It, in my opinion, is the is the best stadium in the world. The sight lines are unbelievable. All that stuff, it's, it's, it's awesome. And Jed York and the York family and, and being able to get that thing built in the state of California, it, you know, da darn near impossible. He pulled off the impossible. Uh, so hats off to him. But this football team is, is good, right? This is a good football team. And it's a team that uh, has high expectations. And it, I just want to see where we can go with it. Right now, it's 90 individuals. We're not a team yet. 
We're working toward becoming a team. The past doesn't matter anymore. It's all about the future. And I'm just really looking forward to watching this team, this group of men become a team and just seeing how far we can take it. So I'm also a fourth Okay, loser. we got how many more? We got one more? Yeah. I'm also a four loser, so the big question I think everyone's wondering is if Kaepernick ready to get us back to the Super Bowl and win. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just because Colin signed a new contract doesn't mean the whole thing rides on his shoulders. You know, when Joe Montana won Super Bowls, he didn't win it one on 22. You know, Colin's an awfully gifted football player. Uh, but once again, I go back. You don't win with individuals. You win with teams. If you want to win a championship in the NFL, and I'll, I'll say this in front of any general manager in any sport, there is nothing more difficult than to win a Super Bowl. There just isn't. Because the playing field is level. And every team has to play within the same rules. Baseball, you got teams that have, are spending six, seven X more than the, the next team. And then yet you got teams like Oakland that even though they're spending five, six, seven X, they're still able to field a, a, winning foot, a winning team. But in football, every year, every year, you gotta perform. And every game you have to perform because you only get 16 games. So it's not on Colin, it's on us. And I, and I like our chances, but it, it starts here in a couple of weeks and we'll figure out exactly where we are when we head to Dallas. So, thank you.